الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي له ما في السماوات وما في الأرض وله الحمد في الآخرة وهو الحكيم الخبير والصلاة والسلام على المبعوث إلى كافة الورى بشيرا ونذيرا وداعيا إلى الله بإذنه وسراجا منيرا أبي القاسم محمد بيته أئمة الهدى ومصابيح الدجا الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ورضوان من الله أكبر صلوا على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد Respected Mulana, my elders, brothers and sisters in Islam Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah Wa alaykum as wa rahmatullah It is indeed a great honor and privilege to be with you all here tonight in celebration of the birthday of the 8th Holy Imam, Imam Ali ibn Mutharida, salawatullah wa salamuhu alayhi. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. And insha'Allah, I'd like to focus tonight's discussion around his title, Ar-Rida. First of all, with regards to the meaning of his title, why is he called Ar-Rida? Then we will move on to discuss why is it that only he was called Ar-Ridha from all, amongst all the Ahlul Bayt We will also mention a few points about the fact that the st- Ar-Ridha is not just a name or a title, rather it is a spiritual station that can be attained by a human being. And therefore we can also learn from this title and the fact that we can also try and attain that station of Ridha. And then finally, I will look at the life of the Holy Eighth Imam and put forward some tips and some pieces of advice as to how we can possibly attain the station of Rida, inshallah. So first of all, with regard to this title of the Eighth Holy Imam, ar Rida. Now of course, you all know that it means pleasure or satisfaction. This is quite clear. But why was the Imam given this title? What was the source of pleasure? What was the source of satisfaction? When we look at dictionaries with regard to this word, we see that Ridha actually has two uses. The original meaning is pleasure or satisfaction, but it, it is used in two senses. First of all, with regards to when you are pleased with someone. So when you are pleased with someone, this can be used, Ridha. Secondly though, when someone is pleased with you. So, if that person has pleasure with regards to yourself, the word Rida is also used. So now we have an understanding of the dictionary meaning and its two uses. We will see how this applies to the Imam. Who was he pleased with that he was given this title? And who was pleased with him that he was given this title? First of all, with regards to a very famous tradition from uh, Abu Nasr al-Bazanti. Abu Nasr al-Bazanti was a companion of three holy imams. The seventh holy imam, the eighth holy imam, and the ninth holy imam. And one day, he comes to the ninth holy imam, Imam Muhammad al-Taqi, salawatullah wa salamu And he asks him about the same question. Why was your father given this title of Rida? So the ninth holy Imam replies to him. He says that, well, what is it that people are saying? And he says that, you know what? Some of the opponents of the Ahlul Bayt Salam, they are saying that he was given this title by Ma'mun. Why was he given this title by Ma'mun? Because he was happy to be the heir apparent. Now you know that he was called to 
Khorasan by Ma'mun to be the Wali Ahad, as they call it, the heir apparent, to be like a type of person very close to Ma'mun. And so he was saying that these people who are against the Imam, they are saying Ma'mun gave him this title because the Imam was pleased to be the heir apparent of Ma'mun. So now the ninth holy Imam replies to him in a very strong way. He says, by Allah, they have all lied and they have sinned. It was not Ma'mun who gave him the title al rida but it was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who gave him the title. And then he goes on to explain why. He says, for this is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was pleased with him in the heavens and the Holy Prophet and the Imams were pleased with him on the earth. So then Abu Nasr Bazanti, he goes on to ask him a further question and perhaps this is a question that has come up in your minds as well. He says, yes, but weren't, wasn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet and all the angels, weren't they also pleased with all the Imams? Why was it that only the eighth Imam was given this title? So then the ninth holy Imam replies him in a, in a deeper way. He says he was given this title because both his opponents from his enemies and his supporters from amongst his lovers were pleased with him. So this is why he was particularized in this sense to be given the title al rida no one else, because this did not apply to any of his forefathers. Only Imam Rida alayhi salam was such that both his enemy, his opponents from amongst his enemies and his supporters from amongst his lovers, they were pleased with him. And so the Imam says to him, this is why only he was given this title of al rida Salu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. <laughs> Now, to develop this a bit further, let's have an example. How was it that even opponents of the Imam were pleased with him? Just one example from history, just to illustrate this point. It wasn't just his lovers and his supporters, it was also his opponents, those who were against his beliefs and his way of life. There was once an atheist who came to Imam Radha alayhi salam. And at that time, Imam was with some people. So the Imam, the, the atheist, he starts a conversation with the holy Imam. The Imam says to him, realizing that he's an atheist, he says to him that, let me put forward this argument now. If we listen to this argument truly, we will understand why he is known as the Alim of Ahl Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We will understand Allahumma sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Muhammad wa ala Muhammad, why he, was, he has this other title of being the scholar of the progeny of the Holy Prophet. He puts forward a brilliant proof that we can all use in our daily lives when we come across those who do not believe in particular God. And we can use this, especially my younger brothers and sisters, is something, it's a simple but very effective proof for worshipping Allah and believing in Allah. He says to him, if what you say is true, and of course it's not true, but let's just say what you believe in is true, then tell me, have all the salat and the namaz and prayers that we have performed, and all the rosa and the fasting and song that we have kept, and the zakat and the tax that we have given, will that harm us? Let's just say, he says to the atheist, if there is no God, and we have spent our lives, we Muslims have spent our lives praying, fasting, and giving zakat, when we die, if there is no God, will that have harmed us? Of course, it will not have harmed us. We have done these things, okay, fine, we did these things. In fact, you can argue that these things by themselves have great benefit. The prayer increases our concentration. It focuses us. It makes us do tahara beforehand. We must be purified beforehand and so on and so forth. The rosa and the fasting, it has lots of benefits. It, it, it makes us appreciate those who don't have food and water. It strengthens our soul. It makes our willpower stronger. Giving zakat, there's no, not only is there no harm in that, but there's lots of benefit. We help the poor. We establish justice on the earth. But let's just say, there's absolutely no benefit. There's no thawab. Let's put it that way. There is no reward. So when we die, there is no Allah, there is no heaven. What have we lost? 
We haven't lost anything. But then he turns it around and he says to the atheist, however, what if there is a God and we have done these things, but you have not done these things. You did not believe in a God. So you just led your life in a very superficial way without any meaning. Then he says to him, surely in that case will not have you have perished and we will have succeeded. It's a, such a brilliant proof. If there is no God and we do all these things, then it doesn't harm us. But if we turn it the other way around and there is a God and you haven't done these things, you haven't worshipped, you will perish and we will be in supreme success. In fact, if you perhaps look at Western philosophy, there's a person called Pascal. And perhaps you've come across this. It's termed in a philosophical way called Pascal's bet or Pascal's wager. It's used by him. And unfortunately, I always tell my students the same thing whenever we discuss Pascal. That unfortunately, his bet is known as Pascal's bet or Pascal's wager. That became so, so famous throughout history and throughout philosophy. But the Imam, who had the same proof in different wording, he had the same argument all those centuries before, he is not remembered as having this wonderful proof. So in any case, I wanted to show this not only to prove how great he was in his knowledge with his debates with the atheists, but also the fact that Sometimes when people have these great attributes and virtues, even opponents, they cannot help but to be pleased with that person. Because these attributes shine like light and they cannot help be attracted towards that person. At the end, what does that atheist say? This is truly remarkable. At the end, he says, Rahimakallah. May Allah have mercy on you. That atheist says to him, may Allah, says to the Imam, may Allah have mercy on you. So just to illustrate that not only were his lovers pleased with him, but also at these moments at least we can say his opponents were pleased with him. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Now to develop this even further, let's look at Rida in a, in a deeper way. We said that Rida it's all about this meaning, double meaning of being pleased with someone and that person being pleased with you. However, let's look at it in terms of Islamic spirituality because we want to get lessons and we want to try and put this into practice and learn from the life of the Imam. So for this, we need to just quickly look at the three levels of the soul which are mentioned in the Quran. Because the third level talks about the station of Rida. And this is why Truly, the eighth holy Imam was Ar-Rida. What are the three levels of the soul mentioned in the Quran? Now, when you look at books, especially books of ethics and akhlaq and spirituality, they sometimes talk about five levels, seven levels, even more. But what I want to do tonight is just quickly look at the three major levels of the soul as they are mentioned in the Quran. Sometimes people say that the reason why there are five mentioned, sometimes seven or even more, is because people expand. There are the three main ones and then people divide them up into more and more. So what are the three levels of the soul in the Quran? First of all, it's worth bearing in mind, it's all about one soul, but it's talking about levels of purification. The lowest level of the soul, I'm sure many of you already know, is known as the Nafsul Amara Bisu. What that means is, there's a level of the soul which is very, very unrefined. It is not purified at all. And it is translated as the soul which commands one to sue. Su is evil. So, Nafsul Ammara Bisu is the one that commands, urges us towards evil. Whenever we commit a sin, this is because our, if we are at that level, the, le the soul is not pure. It is still dirty, it has not been cleansed through ibadah and worship, and it pulls us towards sin. So this is what happens. An-nafsa la ammaratun bisu, as the Quran tells us. So this is unrefined, very low. Here, at this stage, what is the dominating factor? The thing that dominates is carnal desires. The shahawat, all of these things, the hawa. These things are what dominate a person. 
It's what his stomach wants and what this wants and that wants. It's all to do with following his carnal desires. The second level is a higher level. When someone has purified himself or herself a bit more through worship, through sincere ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through following the instructions of the Quran and the Ahlul Bayt alayhi wa salam, they rise to a level called the nafsul lawwama. La uqsimu bi nafsil lawwama, the Quran tells us. I swear by the self-blaming soul, we can translate it as, it's lawwama. Lawwama means it blames us. So the person, sometimes he's, he's at a higher level now, but unintentionally sometimes he sins. Now when he sins, what happens? When he sins, he feels guilty. Isn't it? When sometimes, unfortunately, we do something which we shouldn't, we feel guilty. This guilty feeling is the self-blaming soul. It's the nafsul lawwama. It is telling us that, really, why did you do that? This is against the commandments of Allah, of the Quran, of the Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam. This is a good and a higher position. Because someone who doesn't feel any guilt, obviously that's a very, very low position. We feel guilty, that makes us try to change it, not do it again, to do repentance and tawbah. So it is, it is a higher level, but still, they, there is this sinning that takes place. Now, what is the third and highest level of the soul as mentioned in the Quran? This is where the station of Rida comes in. This is where it comes in. And you all know the verse in Surah Al-Fajr. Ya ayyutuhan nafsul mutma'inna. This is the tranquil soul. This is the soul at peace. Because what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say after that? He says, Erji'i ila rabbiki radiyatan mardiyya. Now notice the words, radiyatan mardiyya. It is from the same root, rida. And we will see why Imam Rida was called Rida, which level he reached. So the soul, the soul that is at peace, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O oh, tranquil soul, return to your Lord. Irji'i ila rabbik. But in what state? This is the key part. Not just in an ordinary state, not at a state where you were sinful and you had the level of nafsul ammara bisu. Not at the level that you were blaming yourself, the nafsul lawama. Irji'i ila rabbiki radiyatan mardiya. Return to your Lord in a state that you are pleased with Allah and He is pleased with you. This is truly amazing. Return to him when you are radi and he and also mardi. Now, then he goes on to say, Fadhuli fi ibadi wadhuli jannati. So enter among my servants and enter my paradise. There are a number of points here. First of all, look at the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this verse. If those of you who have studied some Arabic will realize the tone in this verse is completely different to the tone in the previous two verses. How? In the previous two verses I mentioned with the two previous levels of soul, an-nafsa la'ammaratun bisu. There's nothing special about it. Straightforward fact. Then, la uqsimu bin nafsi lawama. Nothing special about it. Straightforward, factual. Look at the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses the soul which is at peace. He says it in a very soft tone, in a very intimate way. He says, Ya ayyatuhan nafsul mutma'inna. It's very close, different to the other two verses. He says, O soul that is at peace and tranquil, irji'i ila rabbik, return to your Lord. Radiyatan mardiya, that you are pleased and Allah is pleased with you. Fadkhuli. Fi ibadi. He doesn't just say fi ibad. He says ibadi, my servants. In the other two places, there was no mention of my. All of a sudden, we have the ya mutakallim. Ibadi, my servants. Because you are close to me. Enter among my servants. And then truly amazingly, at the end, he says, Wadkuli jannati. And enter my paradise. Now I ask you, paradise, does it belong to anyone else apart from Allah? Of course, paradise belongs to Allah. Look in the Quran. 
There is no place in the Quran, Al Jannah is mentioned so many times, right? Jannah, Jannat, and all its derivatives. There's only one place in the whole of the Quran where Jannah is, is annexed, is jointed to this Ya Mutakallim means mine. Come to my paradise, and this is the only place where Jannah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, attributes it to Himself. Come to my Jannah. Because you are so close to me, you have reached, you have gone over the level of the Ammara Bisu, you have gone over the level of Lawama. Now you have reached a level of complete purification where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with you, you are pleased with Him. This is the station of Rida, and this is the station that our eighth whole Imam reached. He was addressed in this verse as well. All the A'imma alayhim salam because they had reached the level of nafsul mutma'inna. Salu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So this is the level that we must also try and attain. Of course, we will not reach that same level as they did. But at least we have to use these meetings, these gatherings, these occasions to learn from the Imams, their titles, their life, what they did and try to emulate them. So now, the question arises, how can we reach the station of Rida and follow in the footsteps of the Imam? Well, I hinted at this, the fact that we must try and purify our souls. We must try and cleanse our souls, rise above carnal desires because at that level there is no room, there is no entry of carnal desires. It is all a obedience to Allah. So now, oh, it's all about purification of the soul. Let me illustrate this. Sometimes when I talk about purification of the soul or others, they talk about it. It's sometimes a little bit difficult to understand what do we mean by purification of the soul. So let me just illustrate this point by mentioning a story from the great poet, the Persian poet Jalaluddin Rumi. I'm sure you've heard of him. Jalaluddin Rumi, he puts forward a beautiful story about what purification of the soul is all about. He says that once there was a painting competition, okay? And in this competition, there were two groups of people. There were the Chinese and the Romans, or the Byzantines. And the idea was that both sides would paint their painting in a palace, and this palace was made of white marble walls, okay? So it was a very luxurious palace full of mar white marble walls. So what happened was they both went to their sides and they started their work. Now, in Persian literature, no one is better than the Chinese when it comes to painting. In Persian literature, whenever they want to talk about painting and who are the best, they always mention the Chinese. The Byzantines knew this, that if they try to compete with the Chinese at their own game, of course they're going to lose. There's no way they can win. So they used their minds and they did something else. So when it came to the time of revealing the painting, first of all, they asked the Chinese, okay, let, let's see your painting. So the Chinese are on this side. They unveiled the curtain. And everyone who was there, they were astonished by what they saw. They were all praising this amazing, not that one by the way. Yeah. <laughs> not that one by the way, no. But it was this amazing painting with vibrant colors. It was like lifelike, amazing, as you would expect from the Chinese. So now they ask the Byzantines, okay, let's see your effort. Let's see your painting. So now... The Byzantines, they drew away the curtain. All the people were absolutely astonished. They were amazed by what they saw. What was it that they saw? They saw that actually what the Romans or the Byzantines had done, they had spent all their time and effort not painting. Rather, they had simply spent all their time and effort polishing their side of the white marble wall so that it became like a mirror and then when they drew away the curtain it reflected 
the Chinese painting exactly onto their side. It was like a mirror. They had just simply polished it and polished it and polished it so that it reflected that side completely and it reflected it really, really beautifully. So now, what is the moral of the story? What is Jalaluddin Rumi trying to tell us about purification of the soul? He's trying to tell us that we must also try and purify our hearts, our souls. We must polish our hearts and souls to such an extent that they reflect the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in our character. So just like Allah has all the asma al-husna, He is al-alim, He is al-hakim, He is al-adil. We must also try and reflect those names in our character. Of course, we can never be al-alim. We cannot be the most knowledgeable. Of course, there's only one being and that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But it means that we must try and get some ilm. We must try and reflect his attribute of having knowledge. We must also have knowledge up to our capacity. Then he is Hakim, Al-Hakim, the All-Wise. Yes, we cannot be the All-Wise. No way. There's only one being. No created being can be All-Wise. But we can try and get some wisdom, an element of wisdom as much as we possibly can. He is Al-Adil. He is the All-Just. We should try and be just in our lives as much as we possibly can, reflecting those attributes in our character. So this is what is meant by purification of the soul. Once we have done this and we have purified our souls to such an extent, then we will display godly characters. We will start uh, embodying and manifesting these great characters in ourselves. And this is when we reach the level of nafsul mutma'inna, we purify our souls of everything that is not godly and we reach that status. So, sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Now, just to draw some practical tips from this and inshallah, we will end with a dua afterwards. And inshallah, Mulana is here as well, who will enlighten us all as well. So, let's have a look at this. How can we learn from this? Well, the verse I recited at the beginning of this lecture from Surah Tawbah, this tells us that the person who wants this, he will not try and attain anything. It is not Jannah even. It is not the fruits of Jannah. It is not the dwellings of Jannah. It's not the spouses of Jannah. All those things that are mentioned in the Quran, he doesn't want those things. He will get them, definitely. They are a side product. They are a bonus. What does this person want? وَرِضْوَانٌ مِنَ اللَّهِ أَكْبَرٌ The verse says, Ridwan, the pleasure of, from Allah, that is Akbar, that is greater. It's greater than all of these things. Then he says, وَذَلِكَ هُوَ الْفَوْزُ الْعَظِيمُ This is the supreme success. It is not those things. So it is all about wanting Allah and only Allah. Now, for this, we need to do two things. There are two aspects of Rida that we must try and inculcate in our lives. First of all, it is all about being pleased with Allah's decree, meaning Allah's qada and qadr. Whatever Allah decrees for us, we must be pleased with it. We shouldn't complain about it, whatever it might be. Allah's qada and qadr, His decree. Secondly, we must strive so that Allah is pleased with us. Let me illustrate this with reference to the life of the Aima alayhi wasalam. When Aba Abdullah Hussain sallallahu wa sallam hu alayhi When he leaves for Iraq, what does he say? You will all recall when he goes on that journey and he leaves for Iraq, he says, Ridallah ridana ahl al bayt. The rida, the satisfaction and pleasure of Allah is our satisfaction, the Ahlul Bayt. This is a formula, my brothers and sisters, that we must take into account. It's a formula, it's a recipe for success. It means that if the ridaya 
and the pleasure of the Ahlul Bayt is equal to the pleasure of Allah, therefore, if we please the Ahlul Bayt, we please Allah. Isn't it? If, we, if the pleasure of the Ahlul Bayt is the same as the pleasure of Allah, as Imam Hussain says, then if we please the Ahlul Bayt, it means we have pleased Allah. So this would be the first thing. Pleasing the Ahlul Bayt, doing as they say, following in their line, abiding by their commandments. That's the first thing. So now we see this in that verse in Surah Bayyana which talks about uh, the Khayrul Bariya, the best of creations. What does the tradition say? Rasulul A'zam sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. He refers to that verse and he talks to and he addresses Mawla Amir al Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib sallallahu alayhi And he says that the Khayrul Bariya, the best of creatures, who are they? He says, Oh Ali, it is you and it is your Shia. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Oh Ali, Khayrul Bariya, the best of creatures mentioned in this verse in Surah Bayyina. It is you and it is your Shia. You and your Shia on the day of Qiyamah will come in what state? Radin Mardiyin. They will come in a state that Allah is pleased with them and they are pleased with Allah. So like I said, the first thing, it is following in the line of Ahlul Bayt. It is following in the line of Mawla Amir. It is doing as they want us to act in a way so that their pleasure, because it is 100% equal to the pleasure of Allah. This is the first thing. The second thing, like I mentioned, it is all about being happy and pleased and satisfied with the qada and qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whatever he decrees, we should not complain. As long as we have tried our best and we have tried it sincerely. Let me illustrate this with regards to the life of our 8th holy imam. You know, the last verse that the imam ever recited in his life, what was the last verse? When he was about to leave the world, look at even at that sad moment and he's in so much pain and all of that. What does he says, recite? He says, Kana Amrullah Qadran Maqdura. It's truly uh, an amazing verse. He says, and the Amr of Allah, the command of Allah, look how he is obedient to Allah. Look how he demonstrates his satisfaction in Allah's Qadr and Qadha. He says, the command of Allah, it is Qadr. This is Qadran wa Maqdura. It is a precise and definite decree. Allahu Akbar, at his last moment, when he is in that really tough situation and he's in that pain, still Imam Rida displays his pleasure in the qada and the qadar of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You see how he displays that element of being pleased with Allah? So my brothers and sisters, let's learn from this. Let's also be pleased with the Qada and Qadr and decree of Allah. Learn from this great Imam. That's the first thing. He was always pleased with the decree of Allah in whatever state. Secondly though, we said it's about pleasing Allah and making sure He's pleased with us. Yeah, That's the second part. So what example can we give? Can we give any example again for this point that Allah was truly pleased with him as well? Therefore, Illustrate the point that truly he was ar -ridha. Can we point to any example from his life? And we can. And inshallah, I will end with this story. Truly a remarkable story. There was a time in Khurasan, when the Imam had gone there, what had happened was there was a drought. And for a long time, it had not rained. For a long time, it had not rained. So now the people, they started complaining. And they started putting the blame on Imam. Like I mentioned earlier, he was called by Ma'mun to be his heir apparent, his, the Wali Ahad, right? And so they were saying that because you came to Khurasan and you accepted to be the heir apparent to Ma'mun, this is why Allah has stopped the rain. It is your fault. And they started spreading rumors about him. This reached the ears of Ma'mun. Ma'mun comes to Imam Rida and says to him, 
You have to do something about this. Why don't you pray for rain? You know we have the prayer for rain. Why don't you pray for rain to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So the Imam says to him, fine, I will do this, but I will do it on Monday. So Ma'moon asked him, why? Why Monday? And he says, Rasulullah came to me, and also with next to him was Amir al Mu'mineen, salawatullah wa salamu alayhi. Allahumma salam ala Muhammad. And Rasulullah said to me that on Monday go to the desert, pray to Allah for rain, and Allah will send rain for the people. So, so Ma'amun, he has to accept, and he says, okay, on Monday we fix the time and the date. He tells all the people, go to the desert, this is what's going to happen. Ali ibn Musa Rida will be praying for rain. Monday comes, all the people have gathered there. When they gather there, Imam arrives. Now look at the station of Wilaya. Look at the fact that he is not only pleased with Allah, but Allah was pleased with him. So when he gets there, he finds that they have made a member for him. When he gets to the member, he goes on top of the member. First of all, he he praises Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he says that, Oh Allah, you have given us this right. And the people have sought the wassail to us. They have sought intercession through us. That their du'as might be, might be accepted. Oh Allah, send rain to the people. Not just that. He specifies that, Oh Allah, send rain to the people. But after they have gone inside their homes. Okay, now, look what happens. First of all, the people, when they see the face of the Imam and the sincerity and the determination and they know his status, they start immediately going back to the homes. They think right now it's going to just pour down with rain. They start going, the Imam says, no, this cloud that has just come now, you see this cloud? Don't worry, this is not for you. He says, this cloud is not for you. It is for that city, and he names the city even. Then, a second cloud comes, and he says to the people, do not go, this is still, this is not for you. This second cloud is for that city, and he names the second city. Third time, fourth time, it happens ten times. Ten clouds come, very heavy, dark clouds. People think it's for them, the Imam says, no. They, they are for that city. Just imagine the station of Wilaya, the station of Ridaya, being pleased with Allah and Allah being pleased with him that he has this command over the elements and over the weather. So then the 11th cloud comes and he says to the people, Oh people, this cloud is for you. You better now go back to your homes because it will rain like it has not rained before. So then what happens? They all start going back to their homes. Remember the dua that the Imam prayed. Do not make it rain until they have shut their doors. The last person shuts his door and it starts to rain and it starts to rain. The valleys become flooded. Streams begin to flow with water. And this, my brothers and sisters, surely this is a proof that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was also so pleased with Imam Rada alayhi salam that he was able to ask Allah for it to rain in this way. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So surely my brothers and sisters, we can conclude by saying that Imam Rada alayhi salam, yes, he was given this title by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The people were pleased with him, both from his opponents and from his supporters. But deeper than that, we looked at how Rida is a station, it is a spiritual station that somebody can attain. We can all strive to attain and we must strive to attain it by going first from Nafsul Ammara, the commanding soul, to evil, rising higher to Nafsul Lawama, the self-blaming soul, eventually reaching nafsul mutma'inna, the tranquil soul. This is the level that all the Aima alayhi salam had reached. And the two things that we need to do in order to reach this station is to follow in the footsteps of the Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam, 
make sure that they are happy with us because their pleasure is the pleasure of Allah, that's one. And secondly, we must make sure that we are pleased with the qada and qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his decree, just as Imam Rida showed in his life, and just as therefore truly he was ar-rida, and we must also try and become rida up to the level that we possibly can. Let's recite a dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on this blessed night of Thursday and through the intercession and through the haq of Imam Rada alayhi salam, O Allah, enable us all to purify our souls insha'Allah. O Allah, enable us to rise up to the station where you are pleased with us and we are pleased with you. O Allah, enable us to follow in the footsteps of the Aima alayhi salam. O Allah, enable all of those who are facing difficulty around the world, those in Iraq, those in Syria, those in Gaza, in Pakistan, in all over the, all over the world. O Allah, bring all of these people relief, insha'Allah. O Allah, forgive us and our, sin, and, and our forefathers for our sins. And O Allah, last but not least, hasten the appearance of our Imam Ajjalallahu Ta'ala Farajah Sharif. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allah